knocks out on the wall. So um, we need to get started. So why don't we open with prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, the opportunity to be here, and to focus on the spiritual discipline of hospitality. You call us always to be open to reach out to those who are less fortunate than we are. We pray that you will be with us in our reflection and help us to grow in our understanding and appreciation for the opportunities we have to share with others. So bless our time together, we pray, in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, last week I asked if you would take that time, if the handouts, look at the first sheet, uh, and reflect on all that stuff. Um, hospitality is a little easier to handle on in the morning, number one. And just let me say at the beginning, um, Christine Poole, in this one volume, covers Christian hospitality from the biblical perspective and Christian tradition perspective better than anything you'll ever find in one volume. Wow. It's all right here. She's a professor at Asbury <clears throat> Seminary. Um, she does an incredible job. Um, and looking around for resources and stuff, I <coughs> accidentally stumbled across this. This is it. This is all you need. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, she covers it well. I just wanted to say. My Erdman's. Pardon? Erdman's. That's right. It's in. It's in the. It's in your bibliography. Start. If you want something, this is the one volume. That'll do it for you. I mean, she does a wonderful job. What I'd like to do, there are three passages that really set the biblical understanding of hospitality. Um, one Old Testament, uh, the widow is there, but there are a lot of passages, but really the two major stories one from the widow of Zarephath and one from the Gospel of Matthew. They're very famous stories. You'll know that. <clears throat> but from the perspective of, think about, as they're being read, what does it say about the meaning of hospitality? Rob's going to read the widow of Zarephath from 1 Kings. Now, um, and, and as you think about it, and the first page it says, the story of, of Elijah and the widow of Seraphat, what happens, as he's reading this, when the widow offers hospitality? Very simple question. What happens when she offers hospitality? Take it away, Chief. Yep, this is on page 254. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded the widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jar of oil will not be <coughs> until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, 
so that she, as well as he, and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not empty, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord and he, that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you done against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her bosom, carried him up into the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow in whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the words of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again, and he revived. <clears throat> Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth and is true. Thank you. All right. Now, interesting story. What's your first reaction to the, the, the drama that unfolds here in, in light of how you understand hospitality? <clears throat> Anybody? Well, you have nothing. You have not have very little. Say again? You have very little and willing to share it all. Yeah, I mean, and here, here comes this stranger. She doesn't know from Adam's house cat. He asks her from the eat, and she doesn't have anything, and she's got just what little she has for <coughs> she and her son, and no, I'm going to make what I've got, and then we're going to do what? We're going to die. <laughs> and, and here's this stranger saying, I know. I know. Well, before you do that, why don't you make a little cake <coughs> and give it to me? And then you go, what? <coughs> Are you crazy? Now, now note, as you look at that, what happens, first of all, she actually does what? She does it. She makes the cake and she she actually reaches out to the dude and gives him something. Now, and, and one of the things that's going to be interesting, when you look at the theme of hospitality, both Old and New Testament, is always reaching out and sharing from whatever you got, little or a lot. And, and what is the consequence of her actually risking what little she's got? I kept thinking <clears throat> the Lord will provide. She is blessed and the Lord provides. Now, we're going to add a little, little twist and even more to this thing. What's the twist of the drama? Her son dies. <laughs> yeah, the sun kicks off. It's like, what? What? Now, what's interesting is what's Elijah's response, which I think is cool. He saves the boy. Yeah, it's like, listen, Lord, you can't do this. <laughs> but it's like a resurrection. Yeah, it, it, it's like, come on, man, you can't do this. So therefore, he calls on the Lord. This woman has gone out of her way. You can't do this. So he calls on God. God responds 
And what is the revelation as, as the child is brought back to life? How does the story end? The widow acknowledges that the Lord is God. Yes, that Elijah, yes, is a prophet, and indeed God is at work. The word is true. Yes. And so you look at that. Mm. So by extending hospitality, what does the widow experience? Blessed through the existence of God. Yeah, the presence of God. Now, the, the famous passage from Hebrews about sojourners and welcoming strangers. Who do, who do you experience in that presence? And we quote it all the time in Hebrews. Angels. Angels. <laughs> that you'll, you'll, you'll experience angels. That's sort of an example of that. You, you, you experience angels or God's presence in that process. So the whole idea of you extend yourself <clears throat> to strangers and sojourners. And you'll see that theme mentioned over and over again. As you were a sojourner or stranger in Egypt and God provided for you there, you are never to forget that. And therefore, to do what? Provide for strangers and sojourners. And whenever a stranger or sojourner eventually comes <clears throat> into Israel, they are to be cared for and respected. Always. Because you are never to forget that once you were a stranger. Therefore, you take care of it. Oh. So I have a, a question. It's something I've always wondered when I read this and also like the Beatitudes. <coughs> it seems to me that the ethics of the kingdom of God are impossible for human beings to fulfill without God's grace. Oh, that's and, uh, and that's a radical thing. Uh, because many people in, the, in ancient times uh, wrote about ethics, how to become a better person, have a better character. Uh, the Stoics were famous for that. How, how can you be uh, an asset <clears throat> to the community? Well, you can choose every day to do good things. Now, that doesn't take in this idea, which I think is Judeo-Christian, about God's grace enables me to do that. But it seems to me that what Jesus requires in the Beatitudes and his teachings is impossible on a human level. Either if your uh, eyes cause you to sin, pluck them out. I'm not going to pluck out my eyes. You know, if your right hand cause you to sin, cut it off. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And for her, as a, as a mother... She has obligations to her children, to her child. And as a mother, she could think, well, you know, my first obligation is to my family and not to stranger. So I'm just thinking on a human, it's, on a human level, um, I, I think we're not able to do many times what the kingdom ethic call us to do. I know I can't unless I have God's grace. I just wonder what you your take on that is. Well, I'll tell you what. Martin, why don't you answer that question by reading the next passage? <laughs> I'll go to Cole's story. He wrote a fairly famous story about this passage of Matthew. And it was written to try, sort of amplify <clears throat> what it was actually talking about. If you didn't really understand, you read that story and you'll figure it out because a shoemaker did. But this is uh, 31 through... Uh, now, remember remember what Rob just asked, and and keep that in context with the story that you're going to read. Okay. The print's small. I got the wrong glasses, but I think I can read it. <laughs> okay, um, it starts on 31 through 46, I believe it was the assignment. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, 
then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep in his right hand and the goats in his left. Then the king will say to those on in, at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the right hand, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that I saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you as <coughs> naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also... then. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick in prison, and did we not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay. There you go. That, <laughs> so, yeah. and, and that really sort of is a text definition of, of what it's talking about in terms of the biblical notion of, of hospitality. Caring for those who have special needs. Now, uh, it, it's really sort of significant that you have to to notice those around you who have need and then do something about it. That, that's the key. Um, and it's, it's usually people outside of our social circles, if you think about it. Because um, we do not usually in a, in a normal setting, associate with those who have needs or poor or are unlike us. So it's one of those kind of things where we have to really go out of our way to be with those who, frankly, were probably uncomfortable around. When you think about it. But we are we are really charged with those are the folks that we have to show hospitality to, and you know I I never really reflected on this before, but on that first page in the Gospel of Luke, uh, verses twelve to fourteen, says when you invite somebody to dinner. You invite those who can't invite you back, who can't reciprocate. Because what good is that? Essentially, uh, you are going to invite the banquet who are poor, crippled, lame, blind, and you'll be blessed. What? Um, because they can't pay you back. And, and yet, in our normal social lives, who do we usually invite back? <coughs> Like us. <laughs> and we usually <clears throat> we don't say this, but if I invite Robert and Martin and their family over for dinner, 
I'm saying in the back of my mind, I expect them to do what? Except for invite you back. Yeah, invite you back, right? We expect reciprocity. Well, you say, no, 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 no. You should invite those over. You can't invite you back because they're not able. That's biblical hospitality. Uh, and, and so you, you stop and think in terms of Rob's thing about, okay, humanly possible. Well, I, well wait a minute. It, it's humanly possible, but it's humanly uncomfortable is what it is. And you go, no, no, no. Now, we're going to go a little step further. It is interesting to look at what took place at Pentecost. We're going to get there in about six weeks, two months. What was the early community really like at Pentecost? I tread lightly here because I'm not so sure I'm ready for this either. But look what the Christian community emerged as at Pentecost. And it is not what we as American culture are all about. Robert, write the description of the early Christian community in Acts 2. 242 to 47. Acts 2 to which? 242 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God and having the goodwill of all the people, and day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. Okay, what kind of a culture was established? Was it mine and yours? <laughs> no. It was more of a communist culture. Pure Christian communism. <laughs> Who was at the center? Who was the focus? Jesus, the Spirit. And so in that case, everybody came together, the apostles teaching, the Spirit was the center. And it wasn't what I had, it was what we all could come and contribute so that everybody's need would be met. So you established a culture where true hospitality emerged because everybody, everybody <coughs> really was taken care of. You had an enormous quote unquote family. Now, what's interesting at the end of chapter four, I'm not going to read that, but at the end, it's, it's referenced here. End of chapter four, you have the almost exact same culture repeated. And Ananias and Sapphira tried to see stuff under stuff under the bed, and they got axed because of it. But this whole idea of everybody together, it is it's a pure communistic community, and it's community. Family, we're here, we're focused, talk about spiritual discipline. 
We are here to care for each other. And you sit there and go, oh. Now, the thing that I find challenging, the true hospitality, would you trust, would you trust your need, what you, what you really uh, you desire to a church community? There have been a lot of experiments. Yeah, I got to tell you, politics in the church yeah. is yeah. terrible. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. Are, are, are there any survivors of the communal things that started out in the 1800s? No, and, and, and it's one of those kind of things. If, fortunately, if the spirit were truly at work like an axe to, it might work. But it ain't working that way. In, in Israel today, the communes, what do they call them? Kibbutz. Kibbutz. <coughs> when they came from the diaspora back and didn't have anything, they had to do it. But they, there's still some that uh, do act uh, as in common, uh, although I think maybe the bosses get a little more money than the other people or whatever. But mm -hmm. there is some still sense of that. Yes, and 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 uh, you really have to. If you're going to be part of a kibbutz, you really have to make a commitment. Yeah. Uh, that is very very different from anything that you can ever imagine. And it's one of these kind of things. I'm reading the book that really is rather interesting. Richard Horowitz. Uh, it, it's um, called. Um, in, in, the, um, in the Garden of the Righteous. And it's about those who have been honored by the Jewish community in Israel, of those who helped folks get out of Nazi Germany, who were non-Jews. And it's really interesting. They're different, very different kinds of people. Many of them went against their governments and they risk their diplomatic and professional lives. And it's interesting, and the guy did incredible research, 10 chapters that are standalone. Really. <clears throat> but when you read them, and they were declared by uh, Israel righteous. The righteous ones. Yes, the righteous ones. And there are monuments to them as a result. And it's interesting when when they were asked about this, they did not consider it about hospitality. That's radical hospitality in providing safe journey for children and families, of the Jewish families to get out of Germany. Interesting, they said we were doing the right thing. We were doing the ethical thing. But for every one of them, it, it, it costs them. So you look at that and you go, hmm, hmm. Yes, it's possible, but it comes with a cost. And it's interesting, you look at the 12th chapter of Romans, it starts off, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. Do not be conformed to the world, but let your mind be transformed and how you go about living. And, and then the rest of the chapter talks about really how one would live a life of hospitality. But, <coughs> excuse me. I can't help but put this in the context of what I saw last night, which was the play that stage works when the, where the, when the righteous something. But it's about the sit-ins racial tensions in Tampa and when there were the sit-ins here and how they resolved that. And, you know, I think back to all of the civil rights movement, where was the hospitality? I mean, you know, give me a break. It's, you talk about people that were in need, whatever. I mean, 
it, and it's a really interesting play. I recommend it to all of you because it's it's a fascinating story of what happened in Tampa, Florida. I was alive during this period of time, but somehow it just, I mean, I was young, granted, but I didn't even remember there had been cities. Um, um, but it's a real interesting story, and it has a very <clears throat> strong religious overlay to it because, of course, the reverend that ran the whole thing was, you know, he was, uh, he'd actually taught Martin Luther King, but he was, you know, he was of the nonviolent ilk, and there was the other side that wanted to be violent. But his whole thing was based on biblical teachings about hospitality, about inclusion, about, you know, whatever. Um, and the main objection to, of some of the stores that had lunch counters and the thing was, if I let blacks come in here, my white customers are going to leave. So it was all monetary. You know, it wasn't as much, I don't want them here, as it was, it's going to ruin my business. Uh, zero sum game. Hey, Posey. Yeah. I, just a comment on what you're saying there, Chuck. Seems to me that uh, uh, there's a tension there between uh, being part of a community and individual responsibility. In the Bible, also, Paul says if you don't work, you don't eat. And a lot of people look at that and say, well, that just shows that you've got to pull your weight. And so it seems to me that uh, within the Judeo Christian tradition, there's always been a separating of a, a, a more, quote, spiritual group that will share everything and have things in common. For the Jews, it's the kibbutz. You go to the settlements that are there all over, and uh, you've got the most radical Jews that are attracted to that, and they obey all 613 commandments every day. But then the, we have our own parallel as Christians, because not everybody shares everything they have with strangers. But if you want to do that, you join a monastery. And so you become a monk, or you become a nun. And then you renounce all human possessions, and you work in common every day. Uh, the monks and nuns used to work. Uh, whether with a sewing machine or on the fields or whatever. But I see that as a parallel because I, I, again, I don't think that the uh, commands of the kingdom are possible for normal human beings without God's grace. Now, you can disagree with that, but that's why I would argue even within the New Testament, there's that tension. Why did they appoint deacons? to prevent the corruption of the of people seeking things that they didn't really deserve. And so the deacons were assigned the job of screening things. And then uh, you, know, you can go into that uh, in depth. Uh, but it seems to me that we as Christians have our monasteries, which once the Protestants abolished them, I think, really uh, brought up problems for us as Protestants because then you have the ethics that are laid out in the New Testament, which are very challenging, uh, but are almost almost impossible in a daily human life. Uh, and you don't have, as a Protestant, the open option to say, well, I'm going to join a monastery because I really want to not have possessions I really want to give all of you know what I have to the poor, and I can't do that if I have a family and I have a job. Interesting. And so one just the, throwing that out. Yeah. One of the um, references, uh, Rob Dreher, the Benedict Option, believe it or not, is talking about a Protestant way in which families are coming together in this day and age, looking for alternatives in a materialistic society about how to live together in community, which is, quote unquote, if you want to put it <coughs> around it, sort of a monastic kind of way in which you live in community. Now, it's, all, it's always, again, it's still going to be a tension, but it is looking for 
ways in which community can be lived, hospitality can be shared as an alternative to a radically materialistic sure. culture in which we have. And it's sort of interesting, um, people are looking for different ways of how we live life. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's sort of interesting to see whether any of these things for communities work. In the 19th century, there were a lot of, of experimental communities that you didn't did work. Um, there were utopian communities yeah. that went for a lot of different reasons. But these are sort of a different way in which people are just saying enough with what we see in the world today. How can we do it differently? Uh, and, and that's sort of fascinating. Um, and that, that's where the uh, Richard Halverson, who was a former chaplain of the Senate, the statement he makes, which is a little oversimplification, but an interesting statement, where it says, in the beginning, uh, the church is a fellowship of men and women centered on the living Christ. That's what you get with Acts 2. And then he goes, the church then moved to Greece, became a philosophy, to Rome, became an institution, to Europe, became a culture, and then finally to America. Here becomes an institution or an enterprise. A business. An enterprise, uh, and you go, uh, maybe, yeah. certainly, um, a little bit of an oversimplification, but very thought-provoking. What's your response to that statement? Well, Tolstoy's story that he wrote was pretty interesting because it started to address some of the things. The guy, the primary character, was a shoemaker, and uh, I think. Um, he helped these people, but he didn't realize he was doing it. So in the end, he <clears throat> has the discussion with the spirit about, well, when did I do these all, these things? And they took the stuff from Matthew and feed me. So it looks like, uh, as it said back to him, he didn't realize he was doing it. <clears throat> but he gave food, he gave clothing, he made shoes. And so he did all these things. So it <clears throat> turned that story into something that sort of explains some of this stuff because if you think you can just go out and do hey i'm going to do everything at once and I can get these political systems that whether they're marxist or whatever uh, they end up not working well for one reason or another i don't know why but, yeah. yeah what's interesting <laughs> is to sort of step back and look at <coughs> PCPC, and we've got a couple of folks from Witness and Service here. How would you describe what we all do here as a church in outreach and in sharing hospitality? You all from Witness and Service help us understand what are things that we do. Well, if you haven't been to church yet, you haven't heard uh, John Wells minute for mission, and he's going to tell you a bunch. Exactly. So <laughs> you're going to hear that. Um, we have somebody sitting here that, um, did you go yesterday? Some of you may not know about Kindness Matters, and Witness and Service does give some funds for it, but Sylvia Campbell and Kim and Allison Kelly and some other folks, tell them quickly what happens. We go Saturday morning and feed the homeless. Um, we do the same general walk, but other every Saturday except one a month where we do a different thing. We give out not much in the way of substance. We give out crackers or cereal bars or something like that. Um, and we give out public's $10 cards. Uh, one day a month we call it the big walk. There are a bunch of people go. We take a bunch of uh, um, wagons and we have clothes. We have bags that have food and stuff in them. We don't give out the public scars that day, but we have all kinds of clothes that we try to give out. And, um, you know, it's, an, it's an interesting. We've been doing it. I've been doing it for probably seven years. Um, and, you know, we know these people. We 
know him well at this point. We tragically lost one of our, one, a guy that's been with us from the beginning a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, I guess. Um, we had another one who had a stroke and who just came back on the street. He was there last week and he was there again this week. Um, uh, and then we had, then there's Santiago, who's 90, and is on the street and just got out of the hospital. I thought he had just gotten out because he hadn't been there in a couple of weeks. And we ran into him yesterday and he looks great. And I said, when did you get out of the hospital? And he said, oh, a couple of weeks ago, I've been staying with my girlfriend. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But, you know, he, he is such a delight. They are all delightful people and, you know, we've gotten to know all these people. And But sadly, there is there are more new every week. We started out giving out 20 public cards. We went to 30. We gave out 38 yesterday, and I could have given out 10 more. We just can't. We can't cover it, you know. We also, we participate in Bake Cafe. Yeah. We give food to Bethel. 68 hours. Uh, 68, in 68 hours of hunger. Um, some people, Kim, I think you're one of them, participate in the Thanksgiving uh, yeah, refugees. for the refugees. Um, a lot of things that they I think I, if there's a failing of witness and service at this church, it's our uh, communication with the rest of the congregation about what we're doing. I really read very carefully. You know, sometimes you wonder, why do they publish the annual report. That's just a waste of paper. No, 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 no. Not if you take time and actually read the reports. And you don't even scratch the surface with witness and service. You really don't. But you get a flavor of, of I call it institutionalized hospitality. You, you get, it's how the church really tries as much as it can to put hospitality into practice. And it's really biblical hospitality, where you're reaching beyond the walls to try and touch people that otherwise are not touched and trying to make a difference in the community. That's biblical hospitality. Even our Wednesday night suppers are not limited to members. I mean, we have some homeless people have been attending. We have a group from uh, a trailer park yeah. that comes regularly. They fill up a are, table. <laughs> yeah, then our members. Um, then they're opening the nursery to people in the neighborhood. Um, I think we do a really good job at this church. Like the We're ignoring the international outreach to Honduras, Haiti, Uganda. All that's very good. And then one of the key things is to um, what they call interpretation. And, that, and that's let the church know what we're about. Um, and you'd be surprised that the folks that just hang around and are, or are members who really aren't aware of, of how the church seeks to make a difference the lives of others. And I have this theory that churches who are consciously, actively trying to reach beyond their walls to make a difference in the lives of others are the churches that grow. Because people want to be a part of that kind of action. That's why I joined this church. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's really I shopped there. around too, but this church walks the walk. Yeah, it, it's really very important. And how can you really actually put into practice how you can make a difference for others? And that's that's biblical hospitality. Uh, another thing that you might not realize, you've seen if you walk by in the parking lot, but there's the little pantry at dinner. And um, part of your pledge, your gifts, that end up in the budget of witness and service ends up funding those as well as the people that are bringing things. And there's also one at the Judeo Christian Clinic. 
So there are two that are related to our church that are in that little pantry. Robert, I want you to tell them about this <coughs> person matches a budget. Our budget has been about 30,000 bucks for a long time. It's going up this year, $3,500. And of that, we pay dues to um, Love Inc., to um, Hope. We give money, uh, a pretty big chunk, to the Presbytery that we uh, memo to Cedar Curve. Um, it's Presbytery Mission Benevolence. And then, um, as we process these other offerings, people will give beyond the offerings something that touches their heart. And some years, depending, we get some uh, money from uh, the foundation interest. And the budget committee will break off a little piece and give to us. And it's a net a noteworthy amount. This year, it's almost 10 grand. So in addition to our budget of 30, of which a bunch of it is already spent. So at the end, by the end of the year, we're looking at things that come up, but by the end of the year, we have maybe 10 left in our budget and 10 that was came from that interest that may come whenever during the year. Um, we have our December meeting, we call it the pie meeting, because that's where we split the pie. So people will bring up, um, the different um, mission opportunities there are that they are close to. So for example, Kim is uh, close to the Honduras uh, message. It's called the... Uh, and so she's going to lobby for her group. And so is going to lobby for her group. So forth. Um, so, I call it so we split the pie. Well, that pie could be about $20,000, $25,000. Some anonymous donor the last few years has pretty much matched that. There was a $25,000 gift that we don't know where it comes from, but we split this last year, I think about $45,000. Year before it was like $54,000. So that's kind of where it goes. Um, so um, we're hoping. <laughs> So, and, hoping and praying. And we got uh, 3500 bucks more this year. And part of the question was what John is bringing up um, that you'll hear about uh, for uh, feeding every disciple. You might remember Sandra Dean had gotten a $50,000 grant, a lightning grant. <coughs> it's used for that. It's expended. So now it's got to come out of our budget. Uh, and it's going to be about how much? Seven? Seventy five hundred bucks. Yeah. And that just depends on what the need is. Um, so half of the offering uh, is going to go toward that and help us do that. Excellent. Uh, we are out of time. But thank you for, for sharing that. And to know that hospitality is alive and well here in this church. Can you close us in prayer? Creator God, thank you so much for this opportunity to be together and to share our experiences and to listen and to talk about hospitality and what it means in the Christian faith. Help us to go forth from this time together and remember others and reach out to others in the weeks ahead. We have to pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Come here tomorrow at 4 545. Readers, thank you. We're going to go to be